I am so, so happy to be joined with the amazing, incredible, legendary Tabitha Soren. How are you? I'm good. I'm happy to be here. Wow. I'm I'm happy you're here. It's funny. You said, uh, I think when I re- reached out to you, you said I, I better... Um, have like some older listeners, but you, you don't, you don't look, uh, very old and I, you're not very old. (laughs) Um, well, it's, it's more, I I don't think of myself as old, but, uh, it has been a long time since I've been on television and I assumed that's where you knew my work from. So, uh, because I was on television in my twenties, um, you know, many decades have gone by, but I'm, I'm still not old. Well, no, that's, and, and I think that, I mean, that's something, it's very interesting. Like, I think in entertainment, right, like having a second act, you know, because entertainment is, is you know, it seems like, I remember, I think I reached out to you once, or I don't know how, but I remember, so growing up, I was a really big Tupac fan. Like, I loved Tupac as a, as a, as a, you know, as a, as a little kid growing up in Nigeria and then Houston. And I remember I would watch all his interviews, and obviously, I watched uh, Tupacalypse, uh, that, that, that documentary. Um, and obviously, your interviews are very interspersed there. I remember, I, I can't remember if it was something that you tweeted, but it made me get the impression that you were, you kind of had left that behind. Like that was just another day at work for you, basically, right? I was excited to interview Tupac, but people assume because we spent a couple of days together that uh, there was a lot of sort of like off camera time spent together as well. And that's just not us- how these things work. So I'm not sure what I said, but. I think probably my intent was not pretending to be besties with somebody who I knew for a couple of days. I don't consider myself the world authority on Tupac, even though that interview is really well loved. Um, We hit it off, and I think that's pretty obvious. But that doesn't mean, you know, I knew the inner workings of his soul. I just knew what he wanted to tell me on camera those three particular days right well that, that's true and I, I don't think people presume that you are the foremost authority on hillary clinton or like yasser arafat or any of the many other incredible people that you've interviewed that's um, true but i get a lot of questions about what was tupac really like and i thought <laughs> well, well i mean that that's because he died young and and people you know really care about him and love his work uh and my point was just not trying you know, making an effort not to give the impression that isn't, you know, isn't true. Well, and also, you know, you're a journalist, so there's always going to be some sort of a line, you know, like some sort of, you're not, I mean, a good journalist isn't going to be besties with um, whoever they're interviewing or, that, or then you're doing basically PR. Um, but yeah, I mean, so, I mean, Anita Hill, Yasser Arafat, Hillary Clinton, you've interviewed, can you just walk me through like how you, you know, I remember I, I just I was doing some research online, but I, I saw you were in a Beastie Boys video. But how did you go from sort of like <laughs> I guess where you where you grew up to being, you know, someone who um, was delivering news and entertainment and being, um, you know, the the Ted Koppler or, you know, or Ted Koppel or, or, or you know of a generation sort of or you know the uh, yeah. Well, so I will try to be as succinct as possible with my coming of age story. Um, There's a lot of different ways you can go at it, just like anybody's early life. I grew up in a military family, so I was used to moving around. I was used to asking questions to learn about the new community that I was in, whether it was the Philippines or Germany or uh, Destin, Florida, the Redneck Riviera. Um, I don't know if you went there for spring break, but it it is it was a weird place to be a girl. Their idea of femininity at that time was still locked up very much with Scarlett O'Hara and Tara from Gone with the Wind. Um, and I had moved there from the Philippines, so that didn't make sense to me at all. Neither did the segregation. I mean, it wasn't official, but of course it just existed. And um, I don't know what it's like to grow up as a person of color in this country, but I have been in other countries and been the minority. So I feel like I have a little bit of a window into that um, experience or at least some sense of um, how silly it is to look at somebody's the outside of somebody and decide who they are. So, um, I think that just questioning my environment 
and my school and my teachers and the people around me and how to fit in. And, you know, it's not like I was some big rebel. Mainly I was asking questions so that I could assimilate. Um, and though that questioning nature led me to reporting, I was for, I, I, the other thing is, and this sounds so corny and this is so old, but there were these things called pen pals in the seventies. And so I had pen pals that were given to me by this TV show called big blue marble. But then I also had pen pals that I had met and moved away from in Las Vegas or Sacramento or wherever I had lived. And so, um, I think writing all those letters and describing my experience and t learning how to tell a narrative and include my psychological experience in those letters really informed um, my ability to write in high school. And then you get, you know, if you have good teachers, they tell you that you're good at it and then you get to college. And so writing and questions were sort of my uh, wheelhouse and that leads you right into reporting. And I went to NYU and if you go to school in New York City, there are a zillion opportunities to intern and uh, work as opposed to like a lot of my high school friends, because I went to high school in Hampton, Virginia, went to UVA or Howard. And basically there was, you know, one newspaper, one TV show, I mean, TV station and one radio station where they live. So they were all the college students were fighting over those singular places where I had all of Manhattan to um, hit up for a free job. Um, so I worked at CNN as an intern, unpaid, before they were unionized, in my, right after my freshman year. And that was an entertainment job because it was the only position they still had available. And that person recommended me to somebody at MTV News for a short part-time position. And I worked hard there for $5 an hour. Oh, wow. And that that, the only because they asked me, how much do you want to make per hour? And I just was like, uh, what's minimum wage? I just wanted the job. You know, I was still in school. You know, I wasn't, I was barely 18. So right. I didn't know anything. But the idea of getting paid instead of just getting credit was obviously appealing in Manhattan. Um, I had a waitressing job as well to actually make real money for tuition. But um, I, I just had a lot of energy for doing that. The second I started working with pictures because I had worked at newspaper, college newspaper and the college radio station before and the radio station, I did not have a good enough voice. Like there were people there and you're just like, Whoa, like that guy has these natural born pipes. You know, I have like a, a, vo a my voice vo for voiceover. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have a voice that is not strident. It is not super high. I do not sound like a little kid, but, um, it's not those kind of pipes. So, and then when I, I, before that I had worked at the newspaper and everybody there was like grumpy and sad and they were only, you know, late in their late teens. So like this, this is not the environment I want either. So, um, the second I started working with pictures, which was just like, okay, well maybe I'll try television if these other two things are not so great. It was like, oh, okay, this doesn't even seem like work. And I would stay in the editing room until two in the morning just because I wanted, I was enjoying myself. I liked how it worked. And, um, and that experience in the editing room and then taking a crappy job at a local TV station in Vermont, an ABC network, but still like so rudimentary that I had to do my own camera work, which I hated at the time because the equipment was heavy and it was like one more thing for my brain to think about it. And it was, I was already like outmatched by the job because I was 21 or whatever you are when you get out of college. Um, but because I had to do those things in the edit room and with the camera, it completely informed what I do now. So right, um, right. it makes sense to me to go from 30 frames a second with a video camera to one frame at a time in, you know, fine art photography, which is what I'm doing now. So right, right. in terms of the Beastie Boys video, that was slightly mm -hmm. different. I interviewed Rick Rubin for the college newspaper, which at the time was called the Washington Square News. And we hit it off. And uh, I, you know, was a huge fan of a variety of the of different records that he had produced. And I have always been somebody who liked a lot of different kinds of music. And back in those days, it's sort of like you weren't allowed. You, you could be like a, a rock person 
or an R&B person or a hip hop person, but you couldn't be a whole bunch of different things. And yeah, he, he liked true. opera, classical. He knew every Beatles record, but he also was producing LL Cool J in his dorm. So um, that was exciting to me. And when we got to be friends um, at some point, in the city, he asked me to meet him for, uh, we were going to lunch and then he's like, why don't you meet me at this video shoot? We're wrapping up and we should be done by the time you arrive. And of course they weren't done. And it was just the BC boys video and they needed more people in the crowd scene. So they uh, like, <laughs> however I am dressed in the ridiculous like outfit that I have on, that's just the way I walked through the streets of New York city at the time, <laughs> like the big blonde, heavy metal hair and the sort of faux Madonna, like a virgin, uh, dress, all that was just normal. Well, um, that's 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 really what you said about music is really interesting because I think that, so even in the nineties, like if you think about nineties movies, right? There's this very uh, stratified sort of. You have the jocks, you have the cool kids, then you have the losers and nerds. And I feel like like millennials, but even especially Gen Z, everything is sort of like the the kids who are cool also have good grades. And like, you know, there, there isn't, there isn't sort of this bifurcation of like, and I think it's the same thing with music where it's like, you know, I personally, I listen to Lil Durk, but I also listen to Lana Del Rey and like Claro and, um, I listen to a lot of Drake and Future and I, I listen to a lot of Tupac growing up and I listen to, you know, all sorts of, sort you know, I listen to the Grateful Dead, I listen to a ton of Paul Simon and Vampire Weekend. So I, yeah, I think that that's, you're right. Like it is, and I guess Rick Rubin, you know, if I think about Rick Rubin, like who he's produced for, right, that, that he's, he's definitely been someone who's cut across the spectrum um, of all music. Um, were you a big reader at all? I feel like, I feel like reading and writing kind of go hand in hand. I, I, I feel sure. like I picture you reading like Judy Bloom or, or something. <laughs> I did read Judy Bloom. I, I don't, I, I definitely spent much more time reading than my own children do, but I didn't have as many channels and video games and so many other uh, you have a ways you, to entertain myself. Yeah, you didn't have a computer in your pocket 24 seven. Totally. So yes, I, I am still a big reader, but um, I don't read as much as I want to. I always, I buy more books than I read for sure. Right. Yeah. I, I tried, I remember years ago I stopped, uh, I just started and, and only Kindle or, or, you know, Amazon, uh, Apple books, cause I, just the physical space that books take up. But I don't read nearly as much as I, I read a lot growing up, but kind of stopped after uh, high school, college. Um, we didn't have a television in the Philippines, and that's probably where I read the most. The problem was that my parents would go and get us books when they would fly to, I don't know if it was Singapore or Hong Kong, um, another, you know, sort of more populated, more sophisticated uh, city than where we were. And they would come back with these books that, that I desperately wanted to read, but they were printed on rice paper, like this incredibly transparent paper. So when the, the, you would be seeing the next page through the page you were trying to read. And it was really yeah, that's frustrating. Incredible. That's incredible. But also I could get, I could get English books that way, or I could go to the library. So I ended up a combination of the two and i think i read the the, the entire uh nancy drew collection um and those were not great literature but i definitely felt like it, they were great stories right did you live on a base i'm guessing like a, like a military not base? in the philippines my parents kind of made it i i've i don't know if i've ever talked to them about it but i do feel like they made a conscious effort not to live on a base so we were integrated and learned more about the community in Germany. I learned fluent German and went to a German kindergarten um, as, as little kids, you know, pick oh. up. Yeah, when, <laughs> that, don't, don't get the wrong idea that when I went to NYU and I tested into the language department, they put me in starter German. So, yeah, well, I mean, kindergarten is <laughs> probably like one of four German words that I know. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, at the time, I did most of the communication for my parents because it's so much easier for a six-year-old or a five-year-old to learn a language than a, oh, a yeah, grown-up. I mean, you're like yeah, you're like a sponge at that age, right? Um, and um, I I think that us getting a deeper experience than a ba than an Air Force base allowed was part of their intention. And also, I was on a swim team um, in a lot of these places, and 
that would put me in different environments as well. Like we would go to the big city, which was Manila, and I would stay in, you know, often these giant mansions of people who probably were working for Marcos and, you know, embezzling money the way that family <laughs> was at the time. But I didn't know that. I just knew they had, you know, six bedrooms in their house and had a maid. And, you know, it was exposure to a different part of the of the Filipino life because that was not part of my subdivision. And the people that I knew who were Filipino were more middle class or even just working class. Right. I guess at what point, because I, I, I see that, you know, you're, because you're sort of an outsider, it makes sense that you were, you know, reporting almost, right? Like writing and, you know, getting these pen pals. And also, I also just think about moving a lot. Like I, I haven't had to move a lot. And I, I can't imagine when you, you know, it can be very isolating, right? Like you, you form these relationships. And then all of a sudden you pick up and leave. And so I, I understand like how kind of reporting kind of came out of that. At what point did music, like was, was music always something that you were really drawn to or, or, or um, did that come later? I think that music sort of uh, blew my mind or became a serious passion. I mean, as I can remember in elementary school, um, just being obsessed, I would make these... Um, I played guitar. Oh, uh, that's I got a guitar for my eighth birthday, um, an acoustic. It was you know it wasn't like it was something really like rebellious. It was actually kind of uh, gentle and like a Janis I don't Joplin. know slightly conventional. Um, but I remember making these mixtapes. I didn't know I didn't call them that, but I liked certain songs on the radio. I wanted to hear them more often. I didn't have the money to just buy whatever album I wanted. And so I, when the radio, I got a tape recorder with a microphone and when the radio would play what I wanted to hear, I would tape record it through the mic and then, oh. and, and then stop it, you know, before the DJ started talking, I would try, you know, and then I would put those things together. <laughs> I did this. I mean, this is a bit of a tangent, but I, rem I the reason I remember that because I almost broke my nose. I was outside. We had sliding glass doors. So inside is air conditioned because this was Las Vegas. So it was wicked hot. And I was outside and they were playing uh, Stevie Wonder's um, Sir Duke. I mean, this is a 70s. So it's so weird. Like what sticks in your memory? I can't right. tell you where my keys are right now, but I remember this. And, and, <sighs> You know, I knew her, I heard it was ending and I was inside the kitchen getting something to drink. And I had left the gla sliding glass door open because I was just running in and out and I wanted to run back and hit that stop button when I heard the song ending. And I heard it ending. And I had a glass of juice in my hand and I, you know, ran as fast as one could with a glass of juice in your hand. And I smashed right into the sliding glass door because my mother, who was uh, frugal as we all are, as I still am, had shut the door so the air conditioning wouldn't leak out uh. in, in the, you know, the two minutes it took me to get to the kitchen and back. And since it was a sliding glass, I didn't see that it was shut and like it knocked me to the ground. Oh, yeah. A very, very clean household for the glass to be that, uh, that, that, <laughs> that clean Yeah, um. I, or bad eyesight. I don't know. I was <laughs> running. It was a blur. That's not what I was thinking about. I was thinking about like getting there before the end of the song. And needless to say, I did not do that. And I didn't break my nose either, but it was painful nonetheless. That's good. Yeah, so, I mean, so, so that's an instance of me like making it a priority, doing something to, to you know, be better if I had used that, that uh, interest in actually becoming a great guitarist. But instead... I learned a little piano, a little guitar, a little music theory. I, I took a bunch of music theory classes all the way through high school and college. And it was just a way to understand the way people put music together, to learn different tonal systems, to learn about, you know, an, an Eastern approach to music and not just see the Western scale as the be all and end all. Um, but I, I, I ended up feeling very passionate about music making without making music myself that makes sense yeah i mean i i was in the uh recently in cleveland i went to the rock and roll hall of fame and just you know so i mean there's not much in cleveland but but that that was pretty cool i really um, like cleveland but really yeah I, I was only there for two days maybe i i, I missed out on what 
what there is to do there. Also, I went to high school in Virginia, so I can. Uh, Virginia is also a really good music state. You know, bluegrass and. Well, certainly you know. over where I was on the East Coast. I mean, Missy Elliott came out of there, and Pharrell Williams, and um, I mean, not after I had left, obviously. Yeah. But, also, Clips. Clips is from Virginia, or that area. Yeah. I I just was super happy to have Norfolk near Hampton because I could go there on the weekends and and it is the reason that I discovered Violin Femmes and Susie and the Banshees and all these British bands and punk rock and college college rock as it was called um you know like REM and all these bands that were not played on the radio because at that when I was in high school it was still very much either pop radio you know like Casey Kasem's uh top 40 or Aerosmith, you know, sort of AOR was what it was called, <laughs> album-oriented radio. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, I like Tom Petty as much as the next guy, but it really did not, um, it, it didn't really allow uh, some of the bands that were sort of what we would call indie rock now. And, and really, MTV was my route to those bands because... Uh, I later found out, I didn't know this at the time, but when MTV started, and I was in junior high when it started, so this this was, by the time high school had rolled around, I, I don't know if I relied on MTV as much in that way. But in the beginning, MTV didn't have enough programming for 24 hours a day. And what they did was they imported a lot of videos from a British show called Top of the Pops, and so because it was a British show, there were all these artists I had never heard of and hadn't, you know, charted in the U.S. and therefore weren't played on the radio. So, like, it, it was it was mind blowing to see someone like Nena Cherry. I mean, I was just like, what? Like, what genre is she? What color is she? What country is she from? What kind of music is she singing? What does her voice sound like? Is this rap? Is this not? You know, she was just like this total fusion of all these things that I loved. Um, and it took her a while to be played on the radio in the U S. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's incredible. So, but MTV wasn't playing them because they were like iconoclasts. They were playing them because they needed to fill 24 hours a day. Yeah. Well, there's seen that. I think they fill. was it MTV? I think it's MTV that fills 24 hours a day with like ridiculousness that, uh, that one of those TV shows, um, you know, not, well, it's tough. I mean, we, we can talk about that later, but just the transition from, you know, I remember you know, you needed to to see a music video. I needed to, it need, BET needed to play that video, and now I can pull it up on YouTube whenever I want. Um, but so, so, so you were you, you were it said you were twenty three when you joined um, MTV. What was your first role there? Well, my first role was earlier than that. It was when I was an intern in eighty six on the Year in Rock. So uh, I don't even think Kurt Loder was an employee then, and I was just a behind the scenes person while I went to NYU. After that, I got a summer job there as an associate producer. And so I wrote, um, I wrote movie shows mainly, like just their specials. I helped put them together and find footage and listen to interviews and, uh, that somebody else had done and found the best parts and, you know, help put a show together. And then after that, they hired me to, as again, as a part-time job while I went to NYU to write Headbangers Ball. And so whatever at came out of Adam Curry's mouth, I was writing as a, I don't know, 19, 20 year old. And then I graduated. I always did sort of part time things. They're very good at throwing me a bone, you know, from as a freelancer. And that was really nice because it kept me, um, you know, working in the field I thought I would end up working at. I I felt, you know, like I had found my people. There was a, you know, there was a guy named Michael Shore who introduced me to Fila and Sun Ra, and he was obsessed with these musicians I had never heard anything about, and jazz. And then there was another woman named Elisa Bellatini who was obsessed with REM and all things Athens related, like the B-52s. And then there was John Norris, who loved Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey and Michael Jackson as passionately as I cared about the replacements. Like I couldn't under, I didn't know there were pop music fans who loved pop music as much as I did. Cause I felt like my, my passion about music came from them being 
underappreciated, like the replacements and violent femmes and all these indie rock acts that didn't really make much money, didn't sell many records, didn't get much attention. And here was a guy who was as earnest and passionate about George Michael who was like at the top of all the charts. It just didn't make any sense to me, but I loved it. It was like this playpen full of total music nerds. Um, oh, yeah, that's amazing. The, and it we, was lovely. So we, I always <laughs> liked working there, no matter you know what stupid film movie show I was working on with Tom Cruise or whatever. Like It just was a way to um, be in the mix and go uptown and leave Washington Square Park, which I w probably wouldn't have done otherwise. So my first paid job was I quit my job in Vermont because Vermont made me depressed because I don't really <laughs> like the outdoors. And most of Vermont is bucolic and beautiful and very nature oriented or animal oriented. And I had done my share of, you know, bovine growth hormone stories and, you know, recycling and what have you. And I just thought, well, I want to work in television. Maybe I won't be on television. I'll just work in television because I really want to go back to New York City. And you can't be on television in New York City if you have not worked a whole bunch of other places first. At least mm. those were the rules then. Right. And um, so I gave my notice. I moved back to New York City. I took a bunch of odd jobs. I was uh, Robert De Niro's assistant's assistant for a few <laughs> is weeks. It, well, his I, assistant has an assistant? Yep. I, wow. I, I mean, that's the person who's picking up the dry cleaning or, you know, rearranging the calendar. Um, then I was an associate producer freelance at VH1 for a little while. And then... I, somebody got sick at MTV News, which is where I used to work in college. Somebody got the flu and they said, you know, Tabitha, can you fill in for her? And she was sick for a long time. She was like, she was sick for about six weeks. And I had oh, this wow. cardboard box and I had my notebooks and my Rolodex at the time. There was a physical spiraling thing with cards and you hand wrote people's phone numbers and they were, you know, filled with like who the PR person was for this band or that band and the manager of this band and the record company uh, person you need to call. And I would just carry it from desk to desk, depending on who was gone that day. And um, eventually I did enough work that they liked that they found a, a producer spot. Maybe I was a freelance producer. And then they decided they wanted a woman on the air. And so they had, they said, you know, you used to be on air, right? And I said, yeah. And so they brought me down to the studio and I can read a teleprompter like nobody's business because in Vermont, I ran my own teleprompter that I was using. Oh, wow. Under so... the desk, which is like a sort of multitasking. Nobody on live television should be forced to do. But the place was so rinky dink that we were all doing 10 jobs. So because I was used to doing it the hard way when I had somebody else running the teleprompter and having not having to have it be digital and, you know, it was just like, it's like you were jogging with weights on and then all of a sudden somebody took them off. And, and so everybody in the control room, including Kurt, was like, hire this woman. You know, her eyes don't move. Like she didn't make one mistake. Let's go. Like I need to be able to take a vacation once in a while. <laughs> And uh, so, so that's how I got on the air. It was more like Kurt needing backup than well, me being brilliant. Wow, well, uh, I'm I'm glad that woman got sick. Um, you know, <laughs> I, know, you, I know, I <laughs> know, I know. Jane it. Sangster's the reason I have a career. <laughs> Or the or the flu, I guess is. <laughs> um, but both. She but, came back. She didn't die. She did come back good. and. She went on to do, and she she was like the um, electronic music obsessive. So it, we all had a different hat, and it made it it was really representative of all the music that was out there. And um, and I mean, if you look at the people that MTV News at the time paid attention to, they were not big selling artists. We let the programming have that pressure. You know, the Michael Jacksons, the Madonnas, the Whitney Houston's, those people were in heavy rotation with videos. And we were like this niche who didn't have to pay attention to that. 
I mean, every so often I'd interview Guns N' Roses or Metallica or some like giant band. Right. Well, but I also could say, you know, I know these guys in Minneapolis named the Jayhawks and, you know, they have beautiful voices and their songwriting is stellar. They're going to be at South by Southwest. Can we make time to, you know, get to know them? And then you do a three minute piece and like it's not a big commitment, whereas the programming part like that was in a whole nother department. They had to make the deals and negotiate with the record companies and the artists and the managers. And that was nothing I wanted to be a part of. Right. Well, that was going to be my next question. You talk about interviewing Guns N' Roses or Metallica. How are you, especially as a, I believe, 23 year old or like to not starstruck? Right. Because I think when you're working in, you know, I've worked in media. When you work in media, you might be thrust into you know, someone you've, you've idolized, right? Or just even even living in New York or L.A., you'll bump into, you know, who, you know, especially when you're in that in that industry, you might bump into a person who is, you know, who you listen to, who was the soundtrack to your high school years, the soundtrack mm-hmm. to your college years. And so how did you keep, were you, were you ever starstruck? Did you have ever had any, have any moments where you're like, oh, I can't believe I'm talking to this person? I think I had, ex- I definitely felt starstruck periodically, but it, it was often more of in a social situation. I remember sitting down to a table after the video music awards at a party and I was sitting next to Bruce Springsteen. He's not an example of somebody's music I was obsessed with, but it is weird. It's like, Oh my God. Like that's Bruce. Like he's a real person. You want to pinch him, you know, like what (laughs) you're like, it's just, you know, somebody who's been in the atmosphere your entire uh, young adult life, and and there he is sitting next to you, um, and chatting like you know, totally nice. I well, I think that I think that this I I think that I knew professionally that it was important to suppress those instincts. Honestly, there was one artist I never wanted to interview and never wanted to meet because of two reasons one is i i was i was afraid of being starstruck but the other was because she had sort of ups and downs and i didn't want my opinion of her to change like i all these people you can catch them on a bad day and then you are just crushed you know i don't want them to be a jerk I don't want them to be a drug addict. I don't want them to be um, stupid. That's the worst. Um, and that's, probably so, also the mo- that's probably also the most common. <laughs> so I sort of, this one artist, Stevie Nicks is who it was. I just never, I went out of my way not to meet her. Wow. I had heard so many crazy things. And at the time, she wasn't all that in fashion anyway, and she wasn't seen as such a legend. It was like she, Fleetwood Mac was sort of out of fashion. And uh, I was teased at how much I loved her. And it was just a funny <laughs> thing that my friends knew and, you know, like some little secret. But there were instances, especially if we did stuff in L.A. where Stevie was around or through my friendship with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers where I could have met her. And just always begged off. Um, oh, not that wow. she wanted to meet me, but I had, you know, there were just group activities that I could have been in the mix. And so, um, you, you know, I think, I think there were, I, th- I think I learned, and I can't give you a very good example, but I think I learned early that being starstruck, if you're there to do a job, like really is another level of nervousness that you need to suppress or move out of the way. It doesn't help me do a better job. And um, and so, like, if I'm sitting down with Yasser Arafat or Bill Clinton, and he's the president of the United States, and he's the leader of the free world, and we are at the White House, and you walk into the Oval Office, and it actually is oval, and you're <laughs> 23, like, if you let yourself go to that headspace you're not going to be able to get a question out, you know? And by the way, you have now nine minutes and 30 seconds in that time that you've been thinking about whether you're intimidated or not. So um, I, I, I think I got good at compartmentalizing. I'm not saying I wasn't nervous or intimidated or any of that. I think I just was able to push it aside 
somehow. And I think actually probably pushing that aside also took away a little of the enjoyment of the process because there was such a, there was, I felt such pressure to be poised all the time. And especially with the political work that I did at the White House, every single question, every single syllable that came out of my mouth, including ums, you know what I mean, like verbal tics, were recorded and dispersed to every single other White House press corps member. Because every talk or conversation that the president has is then dispersed to everyone else. That's an incredible amount of pressure because the people I'm interested in looking good in front of are the other press corps. It's not so much, you know, other 20 somethings. It's the Andrea Mitchell and Diane Sawyer and Bill Brandt and, you know, just Ted Koppel, like whoever. I don't want to look like an idiot there. Um, Wow. Yeah. That's so, true. so I, I think that it, it became a muscle and then also you're doing live TV, right? That is, that's not a podcast. That is not <laughs> um, a taped, I mean, tape stuff. Like I could do it 20 times, a stand up, same thing. Um, but live TV, like those, those town hall meetings and things that we did, like that was some, whew, that was really intense because every single thing just went, I mean, probably we had a five second delay in case somebody cursed or something, but right. it was, there was no time to cover up your mistakes. And it was with, you know, people trying to run for president. Um, <laughs> so that felt like a lot of pressure. And I remember I came, I came a- after the very first one we did with candidate Bill Clinton they had hired someone whose name I'm forgetting, but she was a famous anchor at the time, someone from CNN to co-host with me because they didn't think I could handle it by myself. And I wasn't going to argue with them. I'd never done live TV in that sense. And it was 90 minutes. So that was a lot of time. Plus oh, wow. the room was large. So like it made sense to have people asking the audience members on two sides of the room, not just one, or have me worried about my place the whole time in running around this room. So I wasn't offended, but it was sort of like back up just in case Tabitha melted down. Um, And I did well, and I was as surprised as anyone else, but whatever. So I go backstage afterwards After some vice president at MTV had told me, patted me on the back and told me I was getting a huge bonus. I was like, yes, that's great. Well deserved. Um, And I'm I'm in the dressing room and other press people had interviewed me on the way back because, you know, they were getting reactions. It must have been in between the conventions because there's this huge lull in media stories uh, during a presidential election then. So, So we were a story. And everyone had or many of the people had, you know, commented on how poised I seemed, how much I knew my material, you know, I'd studied for weeks. It was, but you never know what they're going to say. So like you have to study a thousand things and 20 things come up, but I had overprepared. Um, and I get back to the dressing room and my agent is in there and she and I were friends, but you know, maybe there's a little dressing room. Anyway, I'm getting changed And she's talking about how calm I seemed and how together. And I was like, yeah, I guess I was, you know, like you can't, you're not analyzing how you're doing while you're doing it. Right. It's like, it's like, it's like like an athlete almost like you're kind of, kind of, kind of, I mean, (laughs) my husband would laugh very hard that you said that because I'm very unathletic, but, (laughs) and I take, I take off my pants and they, there's, you know, they were grown up pants. They were like, you know, dress pants. And so they had a lining inside. And the lining like sticks to my legs as I'm taking them off and like getting into my jeans. They're covered top to bottom in sweat because my body had been like getting rid of all this nervous energy. And even, you know, most of the shots were from the waist up, like from the waist up, I looked totally normal. And, and, but from the waist down, my body was dealing with all of the pressure and the nerves. I couldn't believe it. It was so gross. But wow. not, that's probably TMI. But so, <laughs> so like there are two things going on at once, at least at that age. I think after I had more practice, I probably had less physical reaction to the stress. But um, it was definitely there. I just 
somehow at an early age was able to not show it on camera. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, yeah, I can't imagine the White House, especially, you know, Bill Clinton. Um, oh, I also have to ask, what's your favorite uh, uh, Fleetwood Mac song? Mm. I I like Stevie Nicks' solo records a lot. I like, I like, um, there's one that my friends who are in a band played at my wedding. That It's called Silver Spring, and it was one that didn't make the Tusk album, and they re-released it in like the 90s. Um, and it's really lovely. Well, it's it's funny that they've had a, a resurgence with that guy who was uh, on the skateboard. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. It's funny. That's I, I, that is yeah. not my favorite Stevie Nicks song. <laughs> neither, you know, neither is the one that Bill Clinton used in his campaign. But which one is um, that? Don't stop believing. I no, think that's it's not, that's, that's Journey. Or, 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 no, no, or, no. Oh, there's a no. Fleetwood. Okay. The song I've got the title wrong, but those are the lyrics. Right. Don't okay. stop I, thinking I, about tomorrow. That oh, one. that I, I never grew up listening to Steve. So it's a Fleetwood Mac. But I remember like four. I don't know, like how many years ago I was in like a store or something, and I heard the most beautiful song, and it was Landslide. But it was the Dixie mm. Chicks version. So I was like, wow, yeah. I'm, like this is this is incredible. And then I yeah. like w- I downloaded the Dixie Chicks versions, and I went and found uh, the you know the original because yeah. I was like, you oh, know, this is a cover, and then. You know, so. With so many members in that band, there's a in Fleetwood Mac. There's a lot to like. Like Lindsey Buckingham's songs are so snarky and like funky, and they have this like intense beat that he creates with the guitar. I mean, I don't want to call him a rhythm guitarist, but there is definitely rhythm being created from what he's doing, and his voice is is just very um, staccato, and and he's sort of barking at you and then there's stevie nicks who's got that gravelly thing and the witchy sort of spooky vibe and then there's christine mcvee who a lot of people adore her songs her bless her you know r.i.p christine mcvee oh right yeah um her songs were never had enough edge for me they were too pretty um so hers were always the ones that i didn't care about that's interesting. Yeah, I, Landslide was my favorite. I mean, I I didn't listen to, like their entire discography, but Landslide was my favorite. But Dreams has lo- lately been creeping up. Dreams has been like catching yeah, up. Yeah, you're Landslide. all in the like the most played. You got to go deeper into the albums. You well, got, a, a, like start with Tusk. There's hardly anything on there that was a hit. A friend of mine loves Rhiannon, the live version. I have to. I'll, I'll Rhiannon. Turn to yeah, yeah, Rhiannon, yeah. yeah. He, he loves I mean, that one. everybody loves that one. Though for me, those are like you know that's like. I don't know. I, it's just too popular. I've right, just right. heard it too many times. It's like, uh, you know, it, it's lost its power because of the familiarity. That's fair. But it, yes, it's a beautiful song. That's so. So I mean, at that time, so MTV is doing hard news, right? Like you know, MT, I think you know people. MTV is of... doing politics, and right. and that expanded into some hard news. Like Kurt, before I got there, covered the Gulf War. Or at least reported on it. I don't know if they actually sent him anywhere, but he did a lot of stories about it. And then after, um, I don't know if it's after 96 or after 92. So in between campaigns, I went to Bosnia and um, for the Croatian-Bosnian war, I covered... I spent a lot of time with soldiers because they were MTV's audience age. You know, their primary demographic at that time was 18 to 24. It probably skewed a little younger, but officially, probably for advertising dollars, um, (laughs) they said it was 18 to 24. And a lot of the soldiers were, you know, 20 to 25. So it seemed kind of perplexing. Like, why would they send Tabitha to um, Tuzla, Bosnia to cover it? But it was it was after the most intense fighting, so it's not like I was like dodging bullets or anything. Okay. And um, you still had to stay on the path because there were tons of landmines. But I was talking to guys who, you know, basically were the front lines and were so young that um, they probably didn't have much say in the matter of what they were doing. Um, and they had really interesting perspectives and, and fit right into our audience. So because they had somebody who knew how to cover hard news, because I had covered the mayoral election of Koch in New York City with Gabe Pressman at WNBC, and I had covered the gubernatorial elections in Vermont, um, it went from city to state to national, then covered a presidential election, and I had lived out of the country 
it was fairly, and my dad was in the military, so it was mm-hmm. fairly easy to get a hold of what was happening over there. However, that war, you trace, if you go back to trace the origins of the conflict, you go all the way back to before World War I. So I remember like the Christmas before I was supposed to go, the winter break, if you will, or my my winter vacation. I mean, I just had stacks of books, notebooks, things that people had researched for me. You know, I, I just basically taught myself or retaught myself a semester of history that I had forgotten or, you know, put in the back burner. Wow. Um, yeah, that's incredible. I mean, so there, there was intense. I mean, I enjoyed that. I enjoyed. I mean, that's the best part of being a journalist. You're paid to learn something or relearn something. So um, I, I, I enjoyed dropping on the, you know, landing on the ground and understanding partially why these people were at each other's throats. Yeah, and it's, um, it's, and yeah. I'm still friends with one of them. Uh, my translator there um, had a sister who married an American military person, and the sister was helping us with these reports as well. Um, and she had a son, and he was interested in journalism, and I helped him with his application at NYU, and now he's a student at NYU. So, wow, like, full circle. It's, um, yeah, it's nice when, when it's, you don't cut all the ties. So what was, what was your most kind of intimidating, or I guess what was your, I guess, scariest or most, not scariest, like physical danger, but intimidating um, interview? And then what was, I guess, your least, your, your most jovial, like casual, where you kind of just hit it off with, with somebody? Hmm. I did hit it off with Tupac, but because he had, for the, for the formal interview, like the sit down stuff, he had a lawyer with him because he was out on bail. So that wasn't stress free because I had to keep in, you know, like I couldn't, he couldn't incriminate himself. Um, and his lawyer was there to prevent it. And I wasn't get, trying to get him to do it. But sometimes you asked or I asked a question that the answer, I guess, could have. So the lawyer would interrupt. So that wasn't it, the, the part on Venice Boardwalk was very jovial. But right. yeah. um, the other part was much more calculating and and sort of there were interruptions and difficult um i always walked into a situation thinking i was gonna hit it off with somebody i felt like that was the best mental state to be in um the i i think i hit it off and was like the most comfortable with rem and i think that's because I was writing a column at the time that was syndicated by the New York Times and they got in touch with me for a column I had written had nothing musical. I don't know what it was about, but um it wasn't entertainment related or musical and they um I felt like they were they were appreciating me for a lot of the different parts that I had to offer. And so when I did meet them, I felt like we were already in each other's fan club. <laughs> right. And they were smart and they were spending money on saving the rainforest and things that I cared about. Um, they were not people who were only narcissists. And in the entertainment world, as I'm sure you know, you just get very used to what we call at MTV, somebody who had a bad case of the I, me's. And they're <laughs> I, 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 me, 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 I, I, I. And, and that just gets so old so fast. But you know, you're responsible for it because you're sitting there and, and you're asking them questions and they're telling you, I, this, and me, that, you know? Right. Well, that's so, interesting. Um, well, whenever I met somebody who wasn't a narcissist, I was really excited. So did, were you excited when you met Bill Clinton or no? Well, it, it was too nerve wracking to interview the president of the United States or, you know, the and the first time I... Well, I guess I had met him. The first time I met him, I used my local news reporting skills and jumped out of the bushes, basically, at him because we're in New Hampshire in 92 and we're at this, you know, really like boring event. But Jennifer Flowers, who was a woman who accused or or came forward and said she had had an affair with Bill Clinton, 
um, in Arkansas. She had just broken that news. So he was still doing campaign events, but he was dodging the press. He wasn't doing any interviews. And I thought, okay, if I was him, I'm here in New Hampshire to talk to him and he's not talking to anybody. So if I were him, how am I going to get out of this room without talking to people? And so I just left the boring presentation that they were doing and had my camera crew t cover one door set of doors in the back and I covered the other set of doors in the back and and we waited for him to go out that way. Um and I and he went out my door so I got to him first so the camera crew it took a while for them not a super long while but they missed the beginning of me asking him questions and um some other but some other TV station recorded it somebody from New Hampshire and I remember MTV having to um buy the footage of uh -huh. my interview with Bill Clinton because my cameraman I had posted him at the other place but I mean, it made sense so that we could communicate and grab him before other people did. And I got knocked in the head by another, because as soon as people saw us talking, everybody swarmed oh, yeah, over, be, I, you I know, it was like a, mosquitoes. And somebody banged me in the head with their camera, and that's on camera. And he, pat, he patted my head, and I swatted his hand away. There's all this, like, but we had to use all the footage because it wasn't, you know, that's all there was. So all of that was broadcast and I was embarrassed, but I didn't even think about it. It was just like, who's patting my head? And then it was his hand. And I'm sure I seemed like a little kid to him, but it, he probably wouldn't have stopped if I didn't seem like a little kid. Right. You know? Well, that's, I mean, you've interviewed, I mean, Yasser Arafat too, right? That's, I mean, that's gotta be pretty, if not nerve wracking, but just at least. Yeah. I mean, that's another one where I had to relearn all my Middle East history that I'd learned at NYU and really enjoyed. And so I felt like I had a little bit of foundation and understood the intifada and how important young people were in the first one. Um, and so to me, it made total sense that MTV and that audience would be talking to him about that because young people having an influence on policy and politics was sort of what I was there to do and whether it was happening in the Middle East or in the United States, I still felt like it should be on our audience's radar. And that was another challenging interview because we had a translator. I think he understood every single word I said <laughs> perfectly, but he still insisted on having a translator. And when you ask something and then it's translated and then they answer, like there's an extra beat in there that just screws up the vibe. Right. You know, it's really, it's not impossible to do and maybe it was necessary, but I, you know, any flow you're getting going is like, well, just, and also, it keeps being interrupted. Yeah, and also languages don't really map one to one. Like they're just concepts or I got to expand. That's has, true. Like, you That's know, they're, true. Like they're different. Yeah. You know, some words might have multiple Yeah, God meanings. knows what he was asking him. <laughs> right. And so if so if he wanted to avoid my question or not answer it directly, it was so easy and I could blame it on the translator instead of him being evasive. Right. So, you know, there's just no way to know in that sense. You are at the mercy of the process. Yeah, that's inc and, and this is the, I guess a, a quick thing about I mean, so I, I always forget how briefly Tupac's life post you know, bonding out was. I think he died within nine months of being yeah, bonded out. Yeah, it was pretty out. close. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I, I always, I, I forget sometimes, you know, it makes sense because that interview was on Venice beach that that was during that death row period and that he was on, on bail and that he would die really soon, soon after. But I presume if he was probably 25, I mean, he died at 25, so he was probably around 25, uh, at that time. And you were probably around, I mean, similar, like, so it seems like you, you all were probably in the same sort yeah, of age. Do right you know now. what year he was born? Um, 71. Okay, so I'm four years older than him. I was born in '67. Okay, so you, yeah, so you all. I mean, it, it, it just, it, I, I, you know, I'd watched the interview, you know, growing up so much, and it just seemed like you all, you all. I mean, I guess everyone says that that you all just kind of seem to hit it off. Um, but so you eventually left, right? What what made you, you know, we? I know you you you, all, you, you end up becoming, you know, you're now you're now you're a fine art photographer, and you've somehow managed to be incredibly successful in that field as well and have galleries and be uh, have your work featured all over the place. So what was that transition? Well, after the 96 campaign, I felt super burnt out 
and the presidential campaign, that is. And I applied for a fellowship at Stanford. There are two prestigious journalism fellowships or were at the time. There may be more now, but there was one at Harvard and one at Stanford. And I took the one at Stanford. And uh, they pay you your salary to go to school for a year. I mean, like, what? <laughs> just oh, wow. was like, just, just, just whatever, your, whatever your Whatever your salary <laughs> happened to be? Is there a cap? No, like, there's a cap. I okay. mean, I didn't make as much as MTV was paying me, but I made more than a newspaper person did. Right. Um, and, you know, I got to study all these things that I was too busy to study at NYU. I was, I was taking, you know, courses on politics and history and things that I thought would inform my reporting and my journalism career. I was not paying attention to Shakespeare and, you know, romantic uh, literature. So romantic in the academic sense, not in the um, lovey-dovey, hot, <laughs> right, right, right. bodicey <laughs> sense. Um, so, I mean, that I got to spend time with esoteric things, I guess is what I'm, I'm saying. And I, I did this, I had always been interested in the camera. I worked with a camera. I took pictures my entire life, nothing artful, but, um, a zillions of snapshots. Cause otherwise I did not remember my bedroom or where I lived or what the house looked like or my best friend or my teacher. So I was just constantly sort of cataloging the three years in Las Vegas and then four years in Germany. And, you know, I wasn't, I, I mean, I wasn't obsessive, but it was definitely part of the thing. And my mom made scrapbooks and, you know, we just, it was just like part of the fabric of the family. Um, but it never was connected to art. It was, it was like sentimental and information. And when I got to Stanford and took some art history classes and this professor named Alex Nemirov took me under his wing, um, I just felt like my brain was exploding. It felt like I was falling in love with a new topic. And simultaneously, I had the time and access to the dark rooms there and the photo classes and the whole, you know, uh, closet full of camera equipment to experiment with and borrow and rent. And Oh, yeah, um, that's incredible. You know, it's something that other people do in college, but I didn't because I knew what I wanted to do. And so I do, all my free time was spending uh, sort of apprenticing at various media companies. Um, and it just I went there thinking, well, I'll learn how to make more documentaries. I had started making documentaries at MTV and they gave me this, you know, a like a couple of hundred thousand dollars for a budget. And I had a, a staff and we had, I don't know, like 60 million viewers. <laughs> like, oh, wow. like at oh, that yeah. time it was enormous. And I thought, well, I'll go there and I'll learn more about long form narrative. And I got there and all the documentarians in the San Francisco Bay Area said, yeah, we spend 75% of our time raising money. And if we're lucky, we bring it to a film festival and about, I don't know, 100, 150 people come to see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it takes a couple of years and you're gone from home all the time. And I was like, hmm, that doesn't really sound like it hits any of these boxes. Like I had it better you know, 60 million people are seeing, you know, I'm never one of those people wants to make something and nobody sees it. Like, that's just not me. Not even with the art world, even though the art audience is tiny compared to what I had on television. At least it's something. There are artists who never show their work, who make magical stuff and just, it sits in the garage or they do open studios in their neighborhood or something. That's not me. Um, so it just made me start thinking like, well, what do I want to do? Do I want to keep traveling at the drop of a, you know, the hat? Do I want to stay at MTV? I had had offers from networks, but that would require me living in DC, which I didn't want to do. Or I could be the second string of some beat and sort of, you know, do the overnights and the weekends. And mm. it just uh, like that trajectory just made or or be an anchor and never get to do any reporting or go, you know, on site. It just didn't going more into the conventional world of network news. It just didn't seem like the right uh, combination. It was 
it was more conventional than I wanted to be. It felt like wildly mainstream. And okay. I didn't appreciate how niche and like obsessive and celebrating the small MTV was. Like I had this slice of the population as my audience and I could totally go through a huge topic like abortion just from that particular angle. And that's right. like incredible freedom. Like when I would do stuff at the Today Show or NBC, because I did work at some of those places simultaneously, oh my God, my script would have to be so watered down because they had such a huge audience. They had like 75 year olds watching, they had teenagers watching, oh, and they yeah, had everything be in between. And so, I mean, it was just like, wow, this is so dull. You've taken all the edge out of my script. The piece is just boring. Um, yeah, they, I remember them sending so me the, the musical Tommy and thinking like this was right up my alley. I'm like, the who on Broadway? <laughs> you know how old I am, right? Like the who were old when I was in high school. Like, come on. Do you know, you know, <laughs> like Roger Daltrey? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but, and I said that to my agent. I was like, I don't really want to do that piece. You know, could you tell them? She's like, they're not asking you. Like, this is your assignment. It's like, oh, okay, I'll go. I'll go interview the people and Tommy and, and say that young people are going to Broadway again. Sure. <laughs> you know, it was like absurd. Their idea of young people and my idea at the time. Anyway, I was also, I had fallen in love not only with photography, but with a fiance and we were getting married and starting a family and I just had different priorities. Yeah, where so did you I guys covered meet? You and Pardon? Where, where we, you, we met in 96 on the campaign in Seattle. Okay. Um, he was doing a story on young people in politics for the New, New Republic. And uh, I was there interviewing Chris Novoselic, who was starting a political action uh, committee. committee? Yeah. Well, and they were registering people to vote. But the um, it it just – I covered the – I covered the impeachment of Bill Clinton in D.C. when I was five months pregnant. Uh, so after we got married, I got married while I was at Stanford. So a whole year later, um, I think I came back to MTV and had to finish up my contract and then just decided I would go freelance and I'm moving to the West Coast and you can call me when you need me. So they called me for the impeachment. Not long after that, I covered that and I was so pregnant that I kept bumping into everybody. I couldn't get between the aisles. Like it was uh, yeah, just like, a, yeah, this is awful. not, I need to take a break from being on camera because I'm a load. <laughs> um, and it's just uncomfortable. I'm like standing outside the Capitol building, like getting frostbite while I'm pregnant because I'm waiting for the verdict to come in. And um, there was, there's a, there's a harshness to to breaking news and and hard news in terms of how it affects one's schedule and the the restraints it puts on your ability to make decisions based on your personal happiness and mm -hmm. I just decided to get rid of that because I could because I had been uh more successful than I ever expected and made more money than I ever thought I would and so I had I was able to make some choices that weren't about ambition and I, that's probably the first time in my whole life because I did grow up very middle class and always thought about p repaying my student loans and having, you know, I had jobs since I was old enough to get one. Um, it was the first time I thought, like, if I don't have any um, money making constraints, what do I want to do? Wow. And that's, that's a, a really nice place to be in for a short amount of time. I've spent yeah. all that money since then. <laughs> it was nice to have. Well, that's the, a nice... the, the tricky thing is people should know that if you work really hard and you have a place that does pay your expenses, like MTV had me working almost seven days a week. And so if you're working all that and, and I loved it, but you, I was working all the time. Everything I did almost was expensed. Every movie I went to see, every concert I went to see, the clothing, I mean, it did not have expensive taste. It was mainly J. Crew. Um, and then borrowed clothing, but like everything was expensed. And if everything's expensed, you're not spending your paycheck. My paycheck was just like growing and accumulating interest in my bank yeah. account. You know, yeah. like that's, it, there's a, there is a something really lovely about working all the time.
Yeah, no, I worked on Wall Street Brief. Well, I mean, so that's the funny thing about, you know, I, I think I always forget, or not always forget, but that your, you know, your husband is, you know, author, Michael Lewis, right? I mm-hmm. And so I, you know, when I got to, uh, you know, Harvard freshman year, everyone's like, if you want to work on Wall Street, you have to read Liar's Poker. It's like the Bible. You have to read Liar's Poker. And then obviously, you know, he's got other books, um, you know, since. But, you know, I, for, like, I think often when people are kind of a power couple or they're each sort of big in their field, they're sort of intertwined right it's a sort of they get you know Penn and teller or whatever they're not married but, you know, you, <laughs> yeah, you know i understand they, what you're you saying know, simon, yeah I'm, I'm picking example of people who aren't married but you know simon and garfunkel right there you, you kind of intertwined whereas i think you each like you have your sort of legacy as the face yeah you know, i guess you and kurt loader i mean i guess kurt loader was more of the the, the bad news <laughs> you, you know he'd, he'd tell you that kurt cobain died um but you know you have you know you have your legacy, and I feel like you know Michael Lewis has his own separate legacy, and even more recently with the SBF stuff, and you know, that he was following him around, and you know, and, and writing about that. So yeah, it's, I, I think it's rare that you have people who are a power couple, but who can stand alone, sort of that you wouldn't. I I don't, think, I don't think people think it's it's sweet of you to. I think when we met, we were considered a power couple. Um, I do not think that we're considered that anymore. He, he is, uh, and I'm not being false modest. It's it's just the way it is. But if it mattered to me to be in the public eye and to be powerful, I never would have decided to be in the art world. You know, there's like nine artists who are powerful in the war in the glo- you know on the globe, and um, it's none of them are middle aged women. <laughs> well, um, None of them are, I should say, middle-aged white women um, who are heterosexual. Like, I could not be more boring to the art world. But that's fine. Like, I'm in it for the long haul. I just want to make work that people want to look at. And museums and institutions have been very supportive of my career. So it's it's there are so many different ways to be successful as an artist. There's not just – you don't have to just be Jeff Koons. But mm. – I would like to ask you a question because Liar's Poker is a book that when I read it, and I didn't read it till I met Michael, um, because, I mean, Wall Street and Washington Square Park, they might as well be California and New York. You know, like I never went down. Is is Washington Square, that's on 14th Street, right? Am I? No, it's like West 4th. It's near West 4th. Okay, West 4th. Yeah, it's right. It's where the arches are. Yeah, I spent. Um, But it's, Uh, it's where NYU is. So it's, you know, the East Village. Uh, West Village, any of that is it's just very different landscape than Wall Street or the financial world, which is, as I'm sure, you know, no longer located down there. But at the time it was. So anyway, Michael and I, there are paths never met when he was doing his Solomon Brothers stuff. But he's also six years older than me. Right. But when I read Liar's Poker, I thought, oh, this is a very funny book. And these people are obsessed with money and really gross the way they behave with it and the way it is motivating them to behave in their industry. And I can't believe that professors in college hand it out to their well, students. No, so it, it and, wasn't and professors. Don't, and it's why is it not a, a warning to not go into this industry? When you so, read it, did it say like, this is going to be great. I can't wait to have this kind of career. So it's funny. So there, it wasn't a, for, it wasn't professors. It would be like kind of older students. So I, I think it's funny. I think that um what you said about getting to a place where ambition isn't driving you right, or where you know you've made a certain amount of money. I think at Harvard, especially like I was, you know, a lot of the black students. I think all a lot of the black students would kind of come to campus with the sort of like I want to be Barack Obama, you know. But Barack Obama when he was a community organizer, you know, I want to change the world. You know, I want to be a doctor. Or I want to, you know, I want to, I want to. To help people and then what happens is i don't know if you listen to vampire weekend but they have a great song about this called the, the kids don't stand a chance i think on, on one of oh, i'll write that down yeah it's uh they're one of my you know favorite favorite bands um and so i love harmony hall oh yeah they're amazing they're amazing um i got to know ezra a little bit um really LA. does that yeah, mean well, you got to meet rashida jones oh i, I wish well i worked I, I worked with kenya bears who acted alongside rashida jones but i, I myself has not have not met rashida jones um i love uh, her yeah, she's amazing. I could watch her iron clothes or wash well, dishes. Think, I mean, her sister was Tupac's girlfriend when he did that. I it was know. Just a small, I'm small, not, uh, it's, yeah, small kind world, of, kind so, of small world. Relatively. So, I mean, no, how many children does Quincy Jones have? Like <laughs> 500? So it's not that small. 
But anyway, um, go but, ahead. Um, no, well, so you digress. I, you were at Harvard, and, yeah, so and the kids wanted I, to be community organizers, and then yeah, what happened? I think the black, all the black kids kind of wanted to be like, hey, I want to change the world. And then what happens is your, your fall, all these firms, fly, you know, they, they, they come up from New York, and they say, you know, it's Goldman Sachs, it's Morgan Stanley, it's J.P. Morgan, it's Credit Suisse. And, you know, you learn, oh, wait, I can make how much, you know, fresh out of college? I think at that time, I mean, it's more now. At that time, a first-year analyst as an investment bank, investment banking analyst, would probably would make like seventy thousand base and then maybe another fifty thousand bonus. So you're like twenty. I mean, you're working. That's insane. Yeah, you're working nonstop. I think. I mean, in those, those are those are twenty ten. Those are like twenty thirteen numbers. So that it's it's gone up you know, not, since then. Yeah, that so would be hard to say no to. Yeah. So all of a sudden, everyone's like, "Well, I'm gonna, you know, I want to do that." <laughs> you know, and everyone's <laughs> kind of like, "I'll, you know, I'll, I'll save the world later." You know, I can, I can, I'll, let me save myself first. Um. And so I think liars poker, yeah. Because I, I I look back at it now, you're right. It was very gross and kind of this boys club and just how long did money you stay? Around. I was only there for a couple of years because I ended up, you know, I, ended up, I mean, I I would have I I was going to go into the hedge fund industry, but that that got derailed. Um, but I I was um yeah it was I mean investment banking is also just different than trading though trading yeah yeah no, that's about, right you know, that's right yeah banking is more you but know yeah, you I, s it's funny you say that because my daughter is a senior at harvard and she majors in government and is writing her thesis on climate change and is you know wakes she's here now on winter break and she wakes up in the morning and has has zoom calls with eskimos at the top of russia and I'm sure they're not called Eskimos. I'm sorry. That's not right. But whatever the indigenous, it's... it's the Inuits or something? I don't know. I'm not sure. It, it might not even be. It might be even more niche than that. My point is that it's like she's super earnest about it. You know where she... They nominated her for a Rhodes Scholarship. Like oh, wow. it's a Like she's very serious. You know where she's working upon graduation? Goldman Sachs? Lazard. Oh wow! Wow, she's gonna be an analyst. Yeah, she's it's... gonna do it for a couple of years. We sure she masters like some sort of Excel spreadsheet or whatever that well, she that... did it for the summer. Yeah, I've been introduced to the idea of protected weekends. Oh, they started that. You know, oh, they started... all sorts of, and I'm just like, I literally, we had to go shopping for clothes for the summer because she has she doesn't wear anything like this. She has like pink fake fur coats that she wears to class well, you know and she was only allowed to wear gray navy and black um to the you know the internship where well, yeah, she look, made more money than i made at several first jobs but we'd go to i took her to cheap places because i just assumed well she's never going to wear this again um but we so we're at like banana republic or what have you and I said, you know, every every thirty dollar pair of pants I buy you, just know that it it just breaks a little bit of my heart. <laughs> you know, like I've sent her to painting school in Florence. She's had piano lessons since little kid. She's known, you know, the drummer of Wilco since she was in kindergarten. Like, how did I raise an investment banker? Like, well, that, what that, happened? The moment you get, I'm telling you, it, it's 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 a switch. I mean, but that's all, exactly what happened. She was courted by these people who like <clears throat> come to campus and just trap all of you. Yeah, although I feel like some of the people. So I remember when I was in college, every every now and then I'd meet somebody who was doing something different and kind of unique. Because you know, in college, everyone's like, hey, you know, follow your passion, this and that. And so I remember I, I met this I met this great woman, a uh, girl. She was like a year older than me. She's like, I'm backpacking across Europe. And I look it up. Her dad, her dad was Elliot Spitzer, you know, like the former governor of yep, Europe. Yeah, I know and who I Elliot met, Spitzer is. And there's another girl who, another girl, we were in a screenwriting class together, and she was very kind of off, just off the beaten path. She, she had like pink hair and she had a pet pig. And like, no one, I mean, well, you know, at Harvard, no one at Harvard, yeah. lives, at Harvard lives off campus. So to have a pet pig, you have to live off campus, which is, no one really lives off campus at Harvard. Nobody so, lives off campus. And so, over over our Thanksgiving break, I found out that she was Rudy Giuliani's daughter because she shoplifted, and it was, it was like it became a, a big a, a big story because oh it's God. like you know your 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 dad is the is the guy who locks people up, and here you yeah, are. Yeah, he's not. Well, he's also yeah, he's not the only person having a nervous breakdown in the family. <laughs> yeah, that can't be yeah. easy. But yeah, I mean, it's yeah. I, I get I was worried about the stress of Harvard on her, but she's 
I mean, there's just a lot of interesting people there that are working really hard who also are really smart. And yes, they've had many times they've had an a, an advantage yes. um, just by who they're born to. But, you know, it's it's been really um, a good experience. Yeah, um, I bet. I mean, also, like, I think to be fair, sometimes I feel as if, like, everyone goes to Wall Street, you know, McKinsey and Goldman. Like, I think the data, it's like, it's like 30%. Like, there are people who, you know, it's really who you surround yourself with. I was hanging around with the finance guys, so it's, it seems to me as if everyone went to mm-hmm. J.P. Morgan. Well, and, I do think a lot go, and I do think that they go to Yale, MIT, and Harvard first, all those firms. Oh, yeah, they go. It, it's insane. But it's just like, I mean, I don't know, obviously... But even, even now that I think about it, even if you come from money, coming from money and having your own money are very, I'm sure, are very different. So, because I think at that time I would think, well, if I had, you know, rich parents, maybe I would go, I would be like, then I would be a community organizer. Yeah, then I'd go. Yeah. Maybe I I'd wonder what I, I bet there's there must be a study of that. I would love to know. I would love to know what percentage of people with their own money go into teaching for, you know. um uh, but I think teach like, for America. Yeah. But, well, not, but yeah. I think even, not, yeah, I think even now that I think about it, though, I think even quite a few people who came from, you know, means would still, because it's like, you know, it's, it's a world all, they know maybe. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a world. It's, it, and it's a whole social scene. It's you're living in New York. You're all kind of in it together. But yeah, it's, it's definitely, I mean, it's very, it's, it's very interesting, right? You, 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 you learn government and then you go, Make spreadsheets, to, you know, to yeah, you know, yeah, to to to, to do a. a but now when I get takeovers. stuck in Excel, there's somebody I can call. Well, yeah, I forget that. Well, also she must be treated like royalty because of who her father is. I mean that. I don't think poker. so. I don't know. On campus? I don't know. On, on campus, I'm sure. Oh no, definitely not on campus because really? everybody's somebody there. That's you know, I mean, everybody, even if your parents aren't somebody, the fact that you got there means you have something happening. There's That's no. True. I yeah, but um I do you know I here's what she tells me so that I'm not upset. She is that if she really wants to solve climate change or help solve it, that she needs to understand how the financial world works. And if she's dealing with people who have who are private investors of a particular technology or something in the future that would cost a lot, but do a lot of good. She needs for them not to be able to condescend to her. <laughs> well, I think I, not to condescend to her. And I was like, her. well, that's kind of too clever by half. Like yeah. I, I, that, okay. Just yeah. promise me it's a one or two year thing. It's okay. It's not to condescend to her, but I think lots of people have that attitude of like, I'll do it for, but you know, the, well, you, you, you're a, someone who somehow, that's why I was, we're wondering about your transition from uh, MTV to art because you, you get the golden handcuffs, right? You make X amount of money and suddenly your expenses go up and suddenly, you know, Wall Street, you're, you're talking about, you know, I, the, ba- the the base salary might be 90000 The bonus might be another 70000 80000 Yeah, no, I'm sure that's sudden, very convincing to stay. But um, well, I, well, maybe I she, think maybe that, she will. Maybe she will. We'll see. I mean, you didn't stay. Yeah, but I, I had a lot of different things going on. I we'll see. I I, I mean, whatever makes her happy. If uh, it, it's and like I, also to be fair, like making a lot of money is feels great. Like it, it's not. I think sometimes you know they, they, with SBF, I don't know how much you follow the whole crypto thing, but he was. I mean, uh, it's been in my life for a year now. Um, but he, you know, and it's not going away anytime soon. Well, that's that's a good thing for for your husband. Um, yeah, but it I, is. I, I think. Um, you know, he not the exact same argument, but his whole thing is he, there's no like the more money he makes, the better because he can then redirect it towards for the effective causes. altruism. Yeah. yeah, for effective. I and mean, that's not the same argument that your your daughter is making. But I think that he, while that's true, there's also like you know, like I wrote for The Simpsons and I was making a t- you know, I mean not not like Bill Ackman, not as I wasn't a billionaire. <laughs> um, I was a just, you know thirty year old yeah, billionaire no, like SBF, yeah, but I was you know. And so I do think for whatever reason, people feel the need to justify sometimes like going into certain, you know, I need, you know, and it's like, look, it's money's it, making a lot of money is great. <laughs> I mean, you can take care of yourself. You can take care of your friends, your you know family members. You can, you know, someone's sick. If someone's, um, you know, I, I don't think there's any, you know, I think people 
like to shame it sometimes. And maybe there is a certain level like, well, how much do you really need? But I don't, I don't know. I, I don't begrudge anyone who wants to, <laughs> to make money. I think. Well, think we'll that. see. We'll see how it pans out. I hope, I yeah. hope that um, she is able to somehow um, use her knowledge of the way well, the financial world works and not, and be taken seriously by people in, in a way that maybe a community organizer would not be no, she'll you know, learn by a lot some too. billionaire in Germany or, she'll, you know, this is a learn. global issue, not, not something that we're going to just rely on Americans for. So well, she will learn a lot. And I remember I worked on a deal to talk about finance and music. I worked on a deal where Bon Jovi was trying to buy the Buffalo bills. So I'd be sitting in these meetings with John bon Jovi. or the whole band. Oh no, just John, just John. Um, he had a, he, he's made quite a bit of money, but not, he didn't really have football team money. So it was kind of, ah. it was, well, it was a bit funny because like, I, I, and his son of, plays football too, right? His son was a oh, good I football didn't even player. Know, this was years ago. I didn't even know that, but he, they banned his music in Buffalo because everyone in Buffalo thought he was going to move the team to Toronto oh. because he, he had partnered with these two Toronto sort of billionaires or, you know, right. lucrative people. He was sort of the main owner, but it was it was kind of it really let me know how there's a whole other stratosphere of money because the guy who bought the team was this uh, energy natural resources billion you know multi billionaire. He bought the team for maybe two or two point some you know two point five or something billion some insane amount. And so everyone kind of knew because there's a certain there's only a certain amount of debt you can put on a sports team on a, on an NFL team. They have these bylaws, and ah. so you could kind of Google. Um, Bon Jovi's net worth and say, okay, he needs to own X percentage of the equity to be the main owner. And you can only put this much down on the team. So his maximum bid, like basically it was, it was kind of, they treated him almost like he was at the kid's table, you know, wow. um, which I'm like, you know, he, I mean, Does, he doesn't have any connection to Buffalo uh, no, personally. I, no, I it was he, just, I think that New was Jersey. the team that was yeah, that, available. These teams yeah. only come up every, you know, every right. what so often. But it was very fun. I guess. Well, so where can people find your, um, find you, your work? I have a website, www.tabithasorin.com. I have everything you want to know about me, videos, uh, galleries, museum shows, where I'm giving talks. All that is on the website. Oh, and and I'm pretty talks. active on Instagram, although January I've been kind of taking a break. Um, so that's the easiest place I could, I could list, I'm about to go to Savannah, Georgia, cause I'm having a commercial gallery show there. My work is up in San Francisco and Boston right now. Um, oh, but wow. the website would have details. It'd be easier to do it that way. Okay. The, so the website also, yeah, it looks the guy, Terry Pagula, he bought the Buffalo bills for, it looks like 1.4, yeah, 1.4 billion, which now is a steal, but you know, that was much more than uh, Bon Jovi could really afford. Also, I guess my final final as I let you go. There are three. Okay, there, I guess I'm trying to think of the three interviews that I think maybe not the most impactful, but Tupac, Bill Clinton, Yasser Arafat. What's something about them that you could only you know? They, cause I've, you, know you, you're, you're, you hear about things about celebrities or people, but to be with them one on one, especially with you know Tupac for an extended period of time. What's something that we couldn't have gotten, but you, like, you can tell us about any of, I guess each of these people that we wouldn't have, like we wouldn't know if you weren't there. Not like inside information, but just something about, you know, their, how they are, like what, you know, what impression they left you with. Well, Bill Clinton, I, I you know, it's been so long that most of my, um, my perspective or take on these people from 20 years ago or whatever it is, um, might have seemed prescient or uh, you know interesting then, but now they've been in the public eye for so long. It, it you know every secret's probably out. I yeah, mean, well, I mean, you know, well, two of them secret. are dead, for, oh, yeah, for example. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> um, I would say the thing about one thing about Bill Clinton that I'm sure other people have experienced. First of all, uh, like I never felt like he flirted with me, but um, secondly. Uh, the thing he always did that did throw me or did unnerve me or distract me, I should say, not unnerve me, distract me, was to ask me about myself a lot at the beginning of every interaction. So all of a sudden we would be talking about music or talking about, uh, I mean, one time we were talking about my high school reunion and, the, and then they're like, okay, you know, we need to do... Uh, <laughs> 
like, you know, get natural sound or something. And I was like, oh my God, you know, like he, he, he makes you believe and perhaps sometimes he does actually care, but he makes you think that he's really interested in you and your life. And that's just a way to disarm you. But I would fall for it every time. And speaking of the Simpsons, I um, not that I wasn't hard on him. I would recover, but there was a there was a sort of it was just discombobulating to be leaning against the uh, the desk in the Oval Office and have the president start asking you about your high school reunion. Like that's <laughs> weird. Um, but I would walk out of there and and do a Homer Simpson. I would go do. <laughs> <laughs> every because every time I was like ah he did it again you know I had ten minutes with him and two of them were taken up with me babbling about this and he right. did it on purpose little shit <laughs> um Tupac I just think people underestimate his like social justice interest like this is a kid who you know grew up just entrenched in political activism. And like his bad behavior and spitting at cameras and, you know, like dating famous people, um, I think distracted people from his political uh, sophistication. I think that he was on to Trump being this greedy megalomaniac, like way before anybody else. Um, yeah, it was a great black, interview. Black people love Trump at, around that. I mean, like, and he did Trump not. In, he Trump did was, not. He was yeah. asking. I think it wasn't with me. It was, it an was like interview, an interview. Yeah. It was what were you going to say? I think the, it was an MTV interview. I think VH1 it was BET. I don't think it was MTV. Um, but he. I mean, you could be right. I'm not going to go yeah. to the oh, yeah. wall on that. Um, <laughs> but just the things he said about Trump way before I even. I mean, I was in New York, so I would see Trump on the front page of the post and whatnot every so often, but I didn't care about that world he was in. And, and well, sort of yeah, that's too, your, your husband's world. And not, I mean, you're, you know, kind of, because kind of, Trump was really. ridiculous, you know, it was a little different, but yes. So then also, it, was, it was a 1992 the, MTV interview that never aired. That's the, Oh the, really? The, yeah. The Donald Trump thing. Yeah. Where, where Chewbacca's so talking why, about. So why, why did it never air? I don't know. I, I mean, you would know better than I. I think that, you know, these things, I guess maybe huh. just don't, you know, sometimes just don't come out. Rarely. MTV, when I was there, <laughs> and I was there in 92, very, very rarely spent money on things that didn't air. Was it an MTV Raps interview? I'm not sure. It was. doesn't uh, even it say who been. did it. Yeah, it doesn't say. Anyway. I'll, I'll, yeah, I forgot who did um, it. It was a good interview. I mean, I've seen it online, so I, I liked it. I don't know if I saw it at the time. Um, and then Arafat. You know, there's so much secrecy about his world. Anything I can would say would be controversial and easily, you know, questioned. So right. I think I'll take a pass on him. <laughs> yeah. And I, I really only spent a couple hours with him. So, uh, you know, his, his whole life is very, everybody's, there's so much um, hidden. And he was accused of so many horrible things. Mm -hmm. But also, he really was the last person that the Palestinian people took seriously. And, right. you know, talk about some a group of people who historically have gotten the short end of the stick. Like, I, I don't know how you're supposed to, uh, you know, fix your economy if you don't have wa running water. And, uh, you know, there's just some a lot of basics that are still, still not delivered to that group of people. Right. I mean, so how they're supposed to survive or do anything productive without somebody like Arafat fighting for them, um, it's just hard for me to imagine. Right, he was yeah. very grandfatherly with me. Um, he was, you know, uh, I, by that time I had sort of figured out not to take everything uh, seriously said by both politicians and celebrities. <laughs> um, I, I remember him inviting me for Christmas to where he was going to spend Christmas, you know, because, which is like, okay. Yeah, sure. I yeah. was going <laughs> to see my mom and dad, but instead <laughs> I'm going to go to Palestine with Arafat. 
Uh, Undercover, because nobody yeah. can know where he is. Because yeah, that's he, what I'm saying. He's probably, his life is threatened. <laughs> yeah, <I'm laughs> like, he's probably one of those people who is, you know. Has, yeah, he sleeps in a di- he. Well, he told me he slept in a different place every night. You know, oh, that's in, that's incredible. I know, insane. I know, it's um, insane. Also, uh, it, it says they were unable to confirm if that interview ever aired. So I, I, it could have aired, it could have not aired. But also, I mean, Tupac was also so, such an enigma because he's you know he's wearing a bunch of chains. I mean, not in that interview, but he's talking about capitalism is bad. I mean, I, I love I huge fan. He's talking about capitalism is bad, but you know he goes on his Rolls Royce chains, the the lifestyle. Well, but it's all that too. stuff isn't about capitalism. I mean, uh, who knows? Who yeah. knows? But there is something to be said that if your ancestors were enslaved. That uh, you driving a Rolls Royce and wearing twenty two karat gold chains is different than someone no, else I, doing it. I, I agree. You I know, agree. I, 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 it's, I, I, it's more like an f u to history. I agree, and, a, and I, it seems like uh, I feel like he put a lot of money in in the right people's hands. I mean, yeah, I just, Suge he, Knight he, is the exception to that. <laughs> very much. Well, he's I, I <laughs> like that's he's the most intimidating person I ever met in the music industry. Oh, I you was met like, him? Oh, oh <laughs> no! Like, don't get a look at me. Don't like we did not meet. I do not know you. I this did not exist. Oh, like that's when Chris, do you? I don't know. You might not have oh, been I, there I, or remembered. Might be too young. But Chris Rock. I think he was hosting the Video Music Awards one year and he started making Suge Knight jokes and literally like the audience did not know what to do. We were just like, <gasps> like, we don't want to laugh. We don't want to endorse that. We don't want to get shot. Like, what is he doing? It was so crazy. It was the bravest thing he's ever done. That is hilarious. That, that's so funny. Yeah. Well, it's I mean, been a lot of fun talking yeah, to you. It has. I, Thank I, you. I uh, I hope your experience at the Simpsons was great. The highlight of my career was being drawn and included in one of the Simpsons episodes, even oh, though it was awesome. ostensibly to make fun of me. But who cares? <laughs> well, like anything to be in there. It's, and it's an honor. Uh, well, it's I, an honor to talk to you. It's an honor to to to. I mean, you're you're a legend. I I think it's fair to say. You're, you're well, part of a lot of people's childhood. Maybe childhoods. some of your listeners who liked my work on television would also like the artwork if they've grown up uh, like yeah. I do. So yeah. you never know. But it's been fun to talk to you regardless. Thank you. Have a good, uh, have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.